Welcome to Turning the Page. I'm host Donnie Morse of Confetti Antiques and Books. In today's program, we are very excited to have with us author Chad Daybell and a good friend of mine as well, Ryan Nelson, who has read Chad's books and has, has a, quite a bit to say about them. Chad, welcome to the program. Ryan, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chad, I know you have written many, many books. To get started, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got started writing, um, where that all came from, what was your motivation originally to start writing? Okay, I started as a reporter and editor at the Standard Examiner after I'd graduated from BYU in journalism, where I'd served as the city editor. And while I was in Ogden, I kept getting ideas to write a novel, but when you're an editor eight hours a day, you kind of get burned out and don't want to go home and write. So um, I'd actually worked at the Springville Cemetery during college, and so uh, the opportunity came for me to take over as the cemetery sexton there, and I took that job in 1995. And as I worked there, suddenly the, idea, the ideas came more, and I had an idea come for an entire trilogy. You had a little more dead time while you were exactly. there? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing <laughs> what you can think about <laughs> when you're weed eating and digging graves. And I wrote what's called the Emma Trilogy and came up with some characters. They're all based on family members. They're, the story's set right there in Springville and Spanish Fork. And, uh, and so that went really well. I actually got quite a bit of uh, publicity and... Uh, Positive response from exactly. readers. Yes. Who published that for you? Cedar Fort. Okay. And right based there in here in Springville. Springville. Okay. And I got to work with Lee Nelson. He's actually the one that signed the book and mm. encouraged me a, a great deal. And Lee's writing style inspired me, and that's the way I write, is directly, uh, not really flowery, just kind of tell a good story. I guess it's my newspaper background that oh, okay. is why I write the way I do. Um, but um, at a certain point, Lee and the owner of the company, Lyle, asked if I would take over as their managing editor. And so I joined Cedar Fort, where I continued to write books. I moved into more of a nonfiction uh, area for a while. I wrote the Tiny Talk series with my wife, Tammy, uh, for primary children, and then uh, the Ironic Priesthood, Youth of Zion. And so uh, that went really well. And then at one point, I uh, felt I should write uh, a book about my cemetery experiences called One Foot in the Grave. Uh, we that I, went I gotta, really well. We've got a copy here, One Foot in the Grave. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, when I was the cemetery sexton, I would uh, keep a journal every day. And there were just a lot of curious experiences that would happen. That uh, Once I retired from the cemetery, I compiled into this book. And it's actually the favorite book of a lot of people that read my, my books. Can you uh, tell us one story from the book? Sure. Um, one that definitely uh, sticks in people's mind is involves a man named Eddie. He was a kind of a homeless man in Springville. I won't give his last name because people might know him. <laughs> he was buried right next to my office and when, well about four days after his burial, he, I think he stuck around because <laughs> I started having locks picked here and there. We had a lock on our compound where we'd keep the backhoe and I would check it every night but once Eddie had passed away, and uh, it started opening every night. And then uh, another lock on a shed nearby, he had actually unlocked and hung about two feet above the door. And I, kn I knew it was Eddie, it just had to be. And I kind of told him, it's time to go to the light, Eddie. And um, he gave one last ditch effort, I guess. The next morning I found the garbage can shoved in front of my door. Um, the locks were all opened again. and Finally I just was quite stern with him and said, go to the light. It's time to move on. And that stopped the lock picking. So so it's a lot of little <laughs> stories like that of uh, incidents you had there yeah, at the uh, it's cemetery. mainly aimed at, uh, they're humorous stories. Uh, and they're not offensive, but uh, Robert Kirby of the Salt Lake Tribune read it and really enjoyed it and gave it a good review. And 
my own stake president. I've written all these LDS books, but this is his favorite book okay. <laughs> of the ones I've written. So. I, I've actually not seen this before, and uh, I will definitely have to pick that up and read it. I, I really enjoy local history and tidbits of, of stories about uh, our communities here. So that'll be one for me, uh, One Foot in the Grave by Chad Daybell that I would love to pick up. So tell us a little bit more after that, what did you end up doing? Okay, I worked for Cedar Fort for three years as their managing editor, and then I came to a point where I felt I should start my own publishing company, and that's when Spring Creek Books was formed, and we operated out of Provo, and we signed a lot of great authors, and had a lot of success. Really bl grew rather quickly. Yes. I mean, just li literally almost overnight, you guys mm -hmm. went from not even existing to just being one of the main players all of a sudden. Right. Uh, we won the Small Wholesaler of the Year Award in 2005 and 2006 at the LDS Booksellers Convention. And uh, soon we had uh, about 30 authors and had mm -hmm. some really big sellers, uh, a lot of nonfiction books. Um, a lady named Trina Boyce wrote several books for us that were help books for the LDS Church, and those sold really well. Okay. And then I met a lady uh, named Suzanne Freeman, who she had had a near-death experience in 1999, and she met one of our authors at a book signing, and she felt impressed to tell her her story. She'd kind of kept it into her to herself, but she had died and met the Savior and gone beyond the veil, and then had some experiences there and came back. And then um, this author, Shirley Ballman, I think she's been here in the store, uh -huh. Shirley, and she called me up and says, you really need to meet this lady. And I was a little skeptical. I would had a couple other people, I think, try to fool me and, and exaggerate their stories. So I went down to, to San Pete County where Suzanne lived and interviewed her. And now, as a newspaper editor, you knew how to do that. You knew how to yes. interview somebody to really come at them from a couple different angles exactly. to see if they were, like you say, exaggerating or mm -hmm. flowering up the story, so to speak. Because I have read a lot of books about near-death experiences, and also uh, doctrinally, I wanted to make sure she was on track. And I found out she grew up dyslexic. She had never really read any books. Um, she's just a wonderful stay-at-home mother with eight children and uh, but when she was there on the other side of the veil the Savior told her that she needed to someday write her story so this was seven years later and after I had cross-examined her enough I felt confident about it and that's when we put together first her book called Led by the Hand of Christ which is more focused on her experiences in the spirit world but then we after that book came out, she says, I didn't really tell everything because it kind of scares me, but I went to, the, sh the Savior showed me a window that showed future events. Oh, really? And so. Well, Chad, let's stop right there sure. for a moment. Uh, let's, let's go to commercial break. When we come back, we'll talk more about Suzanne and, and mm -hmm. her story and how that led into you writing your series, Standing in Holy Places, a five-volume series about the last days. Mm -hmm. I'm Donnie Morse of Confetti Antiques and Books, and this is Turning the Page. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Turning the Page. I'm host Donnie Morris of Confetti Antiques and Books, and we have with us here today Chad Daybell, author, and Ryan Nelson, an avid reader who has read Chad's series, uh, Standing in Holy Places, and we're going to get and talk, talk to him a little bit about his experiences reading the book. But first, let's go back to Suzanne Freeman. You were talking about her experiences that she was writing about, or mm -hmm. she needed to write. Or Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. So once uh, I met with her in Ephraim and we discussed her story and I felt good about it, we moved forward and she wrote the text, but she's not much of a writer, so Shirley Bauman, an author, uh, helped her compile that and put it together. And we published it and it went really well. And then I felt like... What was the title of that again? Oh, Through the Window of Life. Through the Window of Life. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because the Savior showed her uh, future events in a window in the spirit world, 
and she felt she could actually went into the window and took part in some of these events. So when you say future events, you're saying mm -hmm. like in her life or like world events? Uh, world events that she took part in. Sometimes she was actually participating, other times she saw more of a panorama. And okay. it's just an amazing story that and, uh, really inspired me. It follows along really closely with like LDS church doctrine and that kind Absolutely. of thing? Absolutely. She's a very faithful LDS woman. Um, and like I say, I felt good about it because it stayed right on course with the LDS doctrine, even though Suzanne wasn't much of a scholar herself. And so that verified to me that it was accurate and, and had actually happened. I see. So her name's Suzanne Freeman. Mm -hmm. Her book, Through the Window of Life. Uh -huh. We really recommend to the public pick up a copy of that if you're at all interested in near-death experiences or in the last days. Now, her book directly influenced you in your series, Standing in Holy Places. Absolutely. I had, I feel inspiration to take the characters from my first series, the Emma Trilogy, that I'd written nearly a, a decade earlier, and take them and put them into a, a futuristic scene uh, written in third person. So I took three families, uh, the Norse, the Daltons, and the Browns, and they were all just your average LDS families here in Utah County. Yeah, I said uh, one's even Spanish Fork yet. Yep, uh, the Browns were living in Spanish Fork as the story starts. The other two were living in Springville. And it just takes them forward. It's based on my own family. Uh, uh, your own experiences, that's yeah. how you, mm -hmm. you, you have to write that way. That's Yeah. Uh, some so you've taken your experiences and incorporated it into her story, into the last days. Right. And so it's... As I started it in 2006, I felt that, oh, 2013, 2014 would be an optimal time. I never named dates in the series, but that's kind of what I was thinking as, as I began the series. There were earthquakes and things, and then... Did uh, you have any tsunamis? There's a few in there, okay. yeah. <laughs> and then it just uh, begins to evolve. Uh, there's been prophecies that the saints will gather to the mountains, and and this, these families do, but some characters don't want to. I've tried to make it as realistic as possible. The settings are uh, right here in town. And people will recognize the buildings and the streets. And now, uh, the five the five volume set over a what time span? Does it is it like a ten year span or a uh, five year span? About twenty. Twenty years. The first two volumes cover two or three years. And the third one kind of is a bridge for 10 to 20 years okay. with lots of events. And then the last two take place the last three years before the second coming of the Savior. Okay. So it, I think readers will feel that it, it could be their own family or even themselves and kind of gives a good timeline of what will happen in the future. I think there's some great nonfiction books out there that tell about the prophecies that will take place but not very many people read them. And I actually wrote this for my own relatives and friends. Um, for example, a lot of you might know my uncle Lanny Daybell. He was the state brand inspector. Um, everybody in Spanish Fork knows him. After the cemetery, they say, you must be related to Wait Lanny. Minute, cemetery, <laughs> are, now you're the Spanish Fork sexton. That's right. Um, so you've gone from Springville to, yeah, you've, to you've upgraded to Spanish Fork now. To the Promised Land. Okay, that's good. We, <laughs> okay. we like that. So you found yourself here in the Promised Land now. Mm -hmm. So how did you get from Spring Creek Books to Spanish Fork sexton? Okay. I am actually still the president of Spring Creek Books. But, okay. But when the economy went in the tank in 2008, uh, we had to drastically reduce our company to a part-time operation. Oh, I see. And So Spring Creek Books is still there. You published mm -hmm. your volume five of Spring yeah. Creek Books. And we still publish. But you're not doing your own, your distribution now? Right, and we've changed that to a distributor, okay. Brigham Distributing, which has worked out very well for us. But so suddenly I needed a job to pay the benefits for the family and everything. And Hank Moore, who had been a great cemetery sexton here in Spanish Fork for 33 years, decided it was finally time to retire. And I, the timing was just right. I applied and was able to get the job. And so that's my full-time job, and we do Spring Creek books on the side at night. So do you have another uh, One Foot in the Grave Volume 2 coming out from Spanish Fork? I think there will be a really good volume okay. soon. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. 
Standing in Holy Places, five volume series. Let's go to Ryan for a okay. moment here. Ryan, you're an avid reader. Tell us a little bit about your impressions of the Standing in Holy Places series. I enjoyed it. I mean, in short, I enjoyed Standing in Holy, standing in holy Places. I specifically liked the, brown, the Browns character, and I liked the stories in Guatemala. I got that right, Guatemala. Yeah. Yeah, and um, I enjoyed their, I enjoyed their um, development and how the Browns interact with each other. That, they were my favorite characters, characters. in the book. Uh -huh. Tad, not so much. Yeah. And, and was it, is that the Daltons? That's not the Daltons. Yeah, yeah the Daltons, I was... Oh, mm -hmm. But the Browns, I really enjoyed. Mm -hmm. and Tad goes bad, so hopefully that's yeah. why you didn't like him. <laughs> well, and I, and I enjoyed the... Tad's the one, uh, just so the people understand, there's uh, in book one, the chip comes out, everybody mm -hmm. needs to get the chip, mm -hmm. and Tad kind of gives in. Yes, he yeah. doesn't, I guess you wouldn't call it a sin, but he does follow what the government wants him to do and gets the chip. Gets the chip, gets the money, goes for the lucre, <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, ends up hurting himself and his family in the process. Yes. Um, I too liked, I liked Tad only because I felt that I could see myself having that same struggle. Mm -hmm. You know, but I also liked, the Browns were more that's who I hoped I could be. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, the the stories with the Guatemalan saints I thought were pretty. I thought that was, I thought that was really interesting, and I enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed that part of it. I don't know what book. It's probably in book two or book. I can't remember what book it's in, but I enjoyed that aspect of the series. Right. Yeah. Uh, the Browns go to Guatemala to serve as a mission president and then to become a general authority, and they lead. Uh, the Guatemalans to New Jerusalem. Uh, I can paraphrase each book really quickly if you'd like. Sure, let's um, uh, The Great Gathering covers from that 2013 era up until the saints have been gathered to the mountains and then this, the United States is invaded. Uh, the Celestial City Volume 2 covers uh, from when they leave the mountains to when they travel to Missouri to establish New Jerusalem and the third volume is the one that covers a greater period of time where New Jerusalem is built, the ten tribes return, and uh, the New Jerusalem temple is completed. Uh, the fourth volume, The Keys of the Kingdom, uh, begins about three years before the second coming. And that's where you meet some other characters, some evil uh, villains who will conquer the world. But the, the Browns and the Daltons and and the Norse are all still actively involved in that. Uh, the Browns uh, play a key role in, in helping preserve Jerusalem. And then the final volume, which just came out, uh, uh, covers those last four months before the Second Coming and actually stretches into the millennium. And so it ties it all together, makes you, the people who live today can understand what it's going to be like. Well, let me tell you what I really enjoyed about the series. I think, like you said before, you wrote it for your family, for people mm -hmm. who are not going to pick up a nonfiction book of prophecy mm -hmm. and get into it, and they're, you know, they're going to read two pages and put it down because it just goes right over the top of their head. This series really puts, it says, well, is that true? Is that, is that an mm -hmm. event that could, is that, I better study about that. I better learn more about mm -hmm. that. You know, all these things you just said about, you know, the saints gathering in the mountains. There's prophecy saying that. And a lot of folks just don't know that that's even there. Right. Or about, you know, New Jerusalem. We hear about that, but what does that really mean? Mm -hmm. You know, and so this gives an opportunity to take at least your side of it, mm -hmm. your vision of it, along with Suzanne right. Freeman's mm -hmm. um, near-death experience visions, to build a story around a possible yes. solution to certainly those prophecies. It's just possible. It's fiction. But it certainly makes you think. I have a neighbor who's very been, been very supportive of, of the series, and he's a millionaire. And he read the series, and he talked with his wife and said, would we really leave all of this? Uh, if the prophet called us to do so, and his wife immediately said, yes, we would. <laughs> and he was like, I don't know. <laughs> but, it, you know, it's changed his thinking, even when it comes to food storage and all kinds of aspects of the gospel. I also enjoyed um, parts of, like, local, I, I, I'd say local legend, but local stories that are kind of intertwined with it. Mm -hmm. I, enjoy, I enjoyed the story, and I can't think of the character's name off the top of my head, but when they went up to the Uinta Mountains, mm -hmm. and they 
they found that gold. Right. I enjoyed Nephi that. gold. Yeah. Exactly. I enjoyed <laughs> that aspect of it because we live here, you know, the dream mind. Mm -hmm. I grew up with stories like that, exactly. that my grandma and grandpa used to tell me different, different stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have an uncle who's an avid gold hunter and he kind of inspired that. But there is a character in that, uh, in the third book, The Rise of Zion, who's based on a man my dad knows that worked at Geneva who's actually experienced that. That story, I'm not going to give it away. Yeah, we, it's, we it's don't exciting. want to go there, but it's, it, it really is. So, Chad, we want to thank you for being here today with us. Ryan, we want to thank you as well. Chad will be here at Confetti Antiques and Books, 273 North Main, April 30th from 10 to 2 to sign copies of his books. We'll have as many as are still in print available, including the five-volume series, Standing in Holy Places. Be here April 30th to meet Chad, and thanks again for being with us.